We have a subject this morning that has been generally neglected, but it seems to me is one of the most vital uh, stories in the development of the human family in the last 500 years. Most of you are aware of what were called the utopians, the individuals who dreamed of a better world and made various writings to indicate symbolically the possibility of a perfect civilization. We have the Utopia of Moore, which was an established community of dedicated people. We have the Utopia of Andre in his Christianopolis, the Christian Commonwealth. We had the Campanella, City of the Sun, a Catholic uh, social city of the future. We had Bacon's New Atlantis, established as a symbolical site somewhere in the Western Hemisphere. All these were on paper. The only utopia that we know of that was actually established in modern times was established by William Penn in his position as possessor and proprietor of the estates of Pennsylvania. William Penn was a Quaker, and this in itself has much to do with his concepts, his convictions, and his beliefs. And he has come to be honored today as one of the greatest exponents of human rights. He was born in England in 1644 and was the son of an English admiral. He was well educated and well positioned and it was assumed that someday he would become a member of the British court. However, he did not think this way. He was one of those who was born with a job, and the inclination to that job took in early and dominated him throughout his entire life, which extended about 74 years. Uh, William Penn was a follower of a group of people in serious and desperate troubles in England. When uh, the power of the Roman Church in England was overthrown by Henry VIII, the Church of England came into existence, and it was very largely dominated by the political overshadowing of the government. The Church of England required a, an oath of allegiance to the person of the king. Dissenters rejected this, and dissenters were numerous, and dissenters were badly treated. And among the dissenters were those who we now know as the Friends and as the Quakers. They were persons who believed that the answer to our, relig our religious problem is very simple. We only have to take the words of Jesus as we find them in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Last Supper and in one or two other short sections and live them. It was not necessary to theologize them. It was not proper or needed that we should build a church around thou shalt not kill. This is not a matter for theology or for the formation of an elaborate ecclesiasticism. It is a simple moral fact. And this moral fact must be lived by every Christian if he expects to benefit from his religion. Actually, therefore, the need for a clergy, as far as the Quakers were concerned, uh, was not great enough to warrant the establishment of a permanent physical church. What was necessary was a series of dedications, a realization within ourselves uh, that the various rules of our religion are not uh, fulfilled by acceptance. We can join anything we want to and accept any system of culture that we desire to accept, but this has little or nothing to do with our own personal moral integrity. We are not saved by memberships. 
We are not lifted out of the despond of ignorance simply by being told what to think, how to think, and when to think. Penn was, in early life, subjected to the influence of one of these free thinkers in England and later in the, on the continent. He became aware of the fact that there was a level of personal integrity which constituted a personal alliance with the divine plan, an acceptance of the will of God, not by the mind, but by the heart and the hand, and the willingness to do the things that are necessary to make religion work. He was, of course, surrounded by many different sects and beliefs, both in England and on the continent. But in almost every case, he found that all sectarianism led to confusion. All sectarianism divided religion. It made people claiming the same faith deadly enemies. It caused one group of Christians in Massachusetts to actually execute three Christians of another sect. Uh, such policies are reprehensible that the individual should uh, use his religion to advance his economics, his politics, or any other temporal secular purpose was against the word of God. Now, of course, uh, in even those days, it would be very difficult for a person to live completely and solely upon the authority of his own acceptance of the words of Christ. Therefore, as might be expected, others who believed in the words of Christ violently persecuted the Quakers and those of similar groups, the Pietists and the Amish peoples. They could not tolerate the idea that the great foundations of physical theology should be disrupted. To them, an attack upon their sect was an attack upon God. And uh, the uh, idea was strongly emphasized by one clergy after another that God demanded that the members of a certain faith serve that faith alone and, if necessary, attack and destroy any other faith based upon the same book. This problem uh, reached into the heart of Penn at a comparatively early age. It became obvious to him that somewhere in this picture of things was a great hypocrisy and that someone, somewhere, somehow, must do something about it. He was by nature, as we learn from biography, a rather quiet man, a gentle person, an individual with a good nature, a kindly heart, and a quick wit. He was not a heavily burdened man, held down by the profundity of a great religious conviction. He was a simple person who rolled up his sleeves and said, if we believe it, do it, and accept no substitute for the action. This, of course, got him into trouble in England, and on several occasions he was imprisoned in the Tower of London. But he did not stay or change his ways, and in one of his imprisonments he wrote his most popular book, No Cross, No Crown. Actually, there were a good many dissenters of like mind floating around at that time, and nearly all of them were in very desperate straits. And it came upon uh, Penn in the course of his life uh, to try to make some major change in the social condition of the people around him. Grants of land were being given in the New World. There were grants for New Jersey, there was a grant for Virginia, there were other grants. And uh, finally Penn approached the king, Charles II, and asked to be given an apportioned part of the English area in the Western Hemisphere. Now most of us remember Charles II as a more or less good-natured person. He was the help to found the uh, Royal Society, was an ardent follower of the teachings of Bacon, and was in all not a, not a bad man. He was not very popular at first, 
He wasn't very happy over the fact that his father had been executed, but he did gradually win the approval and general cooperation of the English people. After a long period under Cromwell, they were glad to get anything else. So Charles was more or less open to consideration, and he was willing to consider allowing or permitting uh, Penn to possess some of the land grants which the English crown held in the, in the Western world. Of course, in that, in that gentle situation, Penn had to buy the right to the land. He paid no exorbitant price, but it was a substantial amount for a private citizen to buy an area which was later to become as large as the state of Pennsylvania. But uh, uh, Penn made the necessary arrangements and before he left the king, he said to him, you know, he said, I, I bought this from you, I'm very grateful, but I cannot accept this as a true sale. I, I pay you because it's the way it's done. But I do not agree with the idea that you had a right to sell it to me. Now, if Charles hadn't been a good-natured soul, that would have been about the last we would have heard of William Penn. But Charles was good-natured. But he said, you've paid me for it, so why pay somebody else? Oh, he says, the real owners of that land are the Indians, and they are the ones I'm going to buy it from. This was the beginning of the new attitude which was to rise with William Penn. So having gradually worked out his problems, he established himself, as, or was through the crown, established as the proprietor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. At the Capitol building in Harrisburg now, there is a remarkable series of mural paintings, life-size, called The Holy Experiment. This is the experiment of William Penn's settlement of a new commonwealth in the Western Hemisphere. These paintings carry through the original visions and mystical experiences of Penn, and having passed through his life, show how this experience and experiment was advanced by George Washington and finally consummated by Abraham Lincoln. So to the people of Harrisburg and other parts of Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Penn is a, a really heroic figure and a very important one. Having gotten some land to his possession, he became aware of the fact that on both sides of him were land grants that were locked in a desperate struggle with the Indians. The uh, land grants were in the hands of persons who believed that some foreign monarch had the right to hand them this land without any permission from the Indians who lived here. So Penn started immediately to create a new relationship with the Indians. He not only bought the land again from them, paying in terms that they could appreciate and understand, giving them valid uh, certificates of exchange and ownership, and uh, began to develop on a very friendly basis with these Indians. They, they liked him very well. Many of the chiefs came and visited with him. And all the time he was working to assure them that as the original aboriginal peoples of this hemisphere, they also had inalienable rights and he proved it by definite references to the Bible, which did not approve of slavery. So he did not enslave the Indians, or make any effort to. He accepted them as equals, equal in sharing with his dream. Now this may have had a better meaning and a better significance than we first realized, because the average historian of the subject is unaware of the Great League of the Iroquois. The entire eastern seaboard from Canada to the tip of uh, the South Carolina was under a great Indian alliance. This alliance of the League of Nations uh, was a, a, an early effort uh, to end the um, fighting of the tribes themselves. This uh, league was to create a common government which all the Indians of the seaboard areas up to Canada would accept and abide by. The great symbol of purpose of this league was called the Long House, namely 
that this earth has one roof, the sky. And in that long house, which is the world, all the peoples of the earth must live in peace together, must share their goods equally, and do what is necessary to protect the natural resources and prevent this confusion or evil from arising among the people. Dagan Ovida, who was the leader of this great league, therefore had established something that was almost parallel to Penn before he got there. And in so doing, they could specially appreciate the idea of including him under the roof of the long house. Some of the other tribes were in deadly combat with the colonists who were destroying everything and killing all the Indians they could and then accusing the Indians of cruelty if they had any reaction to try to reclaim what they had been stole, what had been stolen from them. Penn, on the uh, on this hand, therefore, had a great alliance and a great lead leadership with these Indians. They appreciated what he did. They admired his integrity. They knew his word was his bond, and therefore that he could be depended upon to be fair in everything. In honor of this, they created the uh, Penn Peace Belt, which is in Philadelphia Museum, in which the motif is a red man and a white man holding hands together. This was Penn's attitude on this subject. He believed firmly also that he was not speaking as a proprietor of a state. He was not speaking as the owner of properties. He was speaking according to the will of God, according to the truths of God on the grounds that all living things are creatures of God. And to defame, defile, or destroy the least of these is against the will of God. Here we have a curious circumstance, therefore. A man trying to create a political structure, completely religious and completely untheological. This has continued to be the great strength and power of the Quakers ever since. And from, in many cases, they have been called upon to arbitrate difficult situations as the only group that all the world seems to admit to be of honorable intention. So Penn then went on to other things, what were happening in England and on the continent that he felt were wrong. He found, for instance, that it was necessary to create laws that were equal for all persons. After theology, the next thing that had to be eliminated was politics. And this was a mighty job. Of course, those who came over with him were more or less of his mind. He didn't have to work with a completely foreign group. They admired him. Many of them were Quakers and Pietists themselves. Therefore, they were willing to accept his thinking uh, that all public administration was a, a, a responsibility to serve and not an opportunity to gain. Every one of the important laws that were passed must be passed for the benefit of the citizenry in general, never for the advancement, advantage or advancement of individuals. The next problem that came to his attention was the need of education. Here out here in the wilderness where he was carving a state, it was necessary that the educational structure should be advanced as rapidly as possible. Now, what kind of education do you need in the wilderness? This was something he had to work with also. Many of those who came with him were rustics. Some were uh, previously successful businessmen. But education in the new world had to be based upon some uh, value sense. Therefore, the purpose of education was to teach the individual to use natural resources without abusing them. The educated individual is the one who protected the world in which he and everyone else must live. The moment an individual takes personal advantage, he endangers the whole world. So in Pennsylvania, behind the trees, Penn worked out an idea that all leadership was to be aimed directly at the advancement of the understanding and insights of people toward self-reliance, independence, 
and common unity of purpose. The individual should be free to cooperate. This was quite a new thought also, and would have shaken England if it had gotten there at that time. But fortunately, it was on the other side of the ocean. And Nick's point that in connection with education was that no matter what the individual had been before, in the new world which he was building for himself and others, he must do the things that are necessary. Therefore, regardless of his background, he must do the work of the day and do it with a whole heart, not for advancement, not for leisure, not to own, but to share in the creation of a better way of life for all concerned. It was also here that William Penn introduced, strangely enough, trial by jury of the peers. In other words, in England or most countries at that time, if you didn't like a man, you whispered to someone and they threw him into the Bastille or something of that name. The average accused person had no defense. Therefore, the first thing that Penn decided about this was that anyone accused of anything must have adequate defense. He must be able to express his own problem. He must be able to call his witnesses and not simply permit the judge in his periwig to hand down a decision without asking anyone or consulting any legal documents. So Penn set up a jury system in which the accused person was entitled to defend himself before a jury of his peers. Now this jury, of course, was made up of people of the same community in which he lived. They were mostly people of his same belief. And being uh, puritanical or being actually members of the Quaker or Friends organizations, they were inclined to leniency. And therefore, the criminal code was far less cruel than it had ever been before. And capital punishment was restricted to two crimes over only, intentional murder and treason. Everything else had to be arbitrated without pain or torture. The next thing that he decided on was that he did not want prisons. Prisons didn't seem to him to be the right kind of way of treating people who are doing wrong. He says, why should we have prisons, lock these people up in dungeons, and at the same time we have fought us to cut down and no one to do it? So the answer to this was very frankly. And instead of putting people in prison for various crimes, they were given jobs under supervision and paid their penalties by contributing their time and their lives to the improvement of the colony. This uh, seemed to have certain values in connection with the general advancement of the whole project. Little by little, the colony uh, flourished. It flourished largely because of the leadership of this one man who kept on fitting the words of God into the life labors of people. He was a devout man, is said to have had mystical experiences and to have had certain psychic inner life factors. He felt himself ordained and predestined to do the job he did. But because of this, as he himself says, when you go to work for the highest power in the universe, you must go its way. You must do what it requires, regardless of yourself. Therefore, he received many penalties. He had a very painful life in many respects. He was imprisoned. He was ridiculed. He was physically assaulted. But it did not make the slightest difference to him. He would continue to do what he was supposed to do or believed that he was supposed to do. And he finally made a magnificent job of it. Now, looking back on his time and looking forward to our own time, we see, it seems to me, in the story of Penn, something that we ought to all come into greater understanding concerning and adapting it to the needs of the day. I think he was right in assuming, for instance, that the territory which he secured from England and bought from the Indians still wasn't his. This was a very important point. It always had and always would belong to God. The earth under his feet was not his. He was only a proprietor at that time. 
Therefore, he became known legally as the proprietor of the territory of Pennsylvania. He, knew, he said he did not believe in ownership in the sense that an individual could claim to possess anything in life. He could only claim proprietorship for a time. He would have the right to use or abuse the values that we, he associated with his own life for the years he was here. And then it all went back again to something else. Today in our system, we inherit from our ancestry. Uh, and to give it out, we must return it to our descendants. To William Penn, God was both ancestor and descendant. He was the one to whom all things were accountable, who truly never slumbered nor slept, could not be avoided or evaded in any way. On the other hand, he was working with a problem which needed housing, needed crops and farming, and needed everything necessary to sustain the people. Therefore, he had to uh, work out a system of thought in which he could combine his religious principles and his political convictions, or non-political convictions, if you want to look at them that way. So William Penn began the very serious problem of getting people to live right. It was no longer possible to do what had happened in the old country. He did not believe that one sect after another should depart in high dudgeon from the old country for the one and only purpose of doing as they pleased. He did not believe that they should ri rise in rebellion, shoot each other in the name of peace. He did not believe that they should go around trying to convert each other to somebody else's beliefs. So uh, Penn made it a very simple problem. He did not do what uh, Calpius and some of the pietists did, and that is to create a highly religious group. He did not uh, turn his colony into a meditation school or something of that nature. He did not take his people, bind them by extreme rules, impose celibacy upon them, refuse to allow them to wear anything but black, and just keep on living in a highly religious atmosphere. He said that wasn't the way it was intended to be. The really good Christian is a working person with his own family, with his own needs, with his social relationships, and with the important co cooperations with the community of which he was a part. Therefore, the true person in the light of God was the individual who lived a normal life. And for Penn, a normal life was a, de a life dedicated to principles. Each individual could word the principles as he pleased, but all must work together to enforce them or make them available to each other in any need and trouble. In emergency, they were all one family. And in peace and prosperity, they were all in one family. The idea of any kind of factionism was very unpleasant to him. He did not believe in rising of political parties. He did not believe in trying to force regulations upon people against their wills. <clears throat> if a person was, is right, and if a re legislation is necessary, he will accept it. But if he does not trust the legislation or those who produce it and knows that it is not going to be equally fair for all concerned, then he has a right to decline any cooperation with it. <clears throat> also, Penn was the one of the first in this country to refuse to give oath at, in a court of law. He would not swear to any particular statement of his own or anybody else's. In fact, today, this situation is still prominent among some of the Amish peoples and so on. They will give their word of honor, but they will not bow or take an oath. So uh, Penn said, we don't want anyone to take an oath. If what he says is true, then he says it, and we believe him. If we, what he says is not true, and he takes an oath that it is true, then he has definitely offended God. This is dishonesty. And the one thing that can destroy the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is dishonesty. 
So honesty was very, very important in these groups. And for the most part, in the first hundred years of the Pennsylvania experience, uh, Penn and his descendant leaders uh, maintain this code with considerable clarity of purpose. Uh, they opposed almost everything that was against the common good and refused to permit it to come in. They regulated their industries very carefully to make sure that everything was fair and square and that the new world, the world of our hope, the world of a better life than we have ever known, the world in which the problems that deluge us today no longer exist, that is a world in which individuals are naturally, simply, honest and good-hearted. That all the rest is thunder. Unless the individual is of kind heart, who, who believes in helping, who desires to serve, and who worships gods through cooperating with natural law, as long as those people exist, there's hope. If those people fail, then there is no hope. Now, in the times of uh, Penn's beginnings, uh, they opened the uh, territory not only to uh, Quakers and Friends, but to other groups. Any persecuted group in England or the areas around the Netherlands and Germany could come and live in Pennsylvania. They could worship as they pleased. No one was going to say that they had to take an oath to do anything or not take an oath. The purpose was that if they were persecuted and had the courage to live right and wanted the opportunity to live peacefully with each other, Pennsylvania was the place. And they came from many different areas. And Penn caused them to come to a simple conclusion. If you want to stay here, like each other. If you want to be a part of this community, love one another as the Master has told us to. And if you can't do that, move on. It worked. And that is the thing that's possibly the most amazing part of the whole Penn story. It was a utopia that worked. It was a utopia that could be put into practice, whereas the others all existed only on paper. This was the utopia of a seasoned, mature recognition of trouble. Penn was aware of the problems of England and Ireland of his time. He saw what was making the trouble. He saw the rules and laws that were responsible for injustice. He recognized the cupidity of both the rich and the poor. He realized that the world was being governed by a few people at the expense of the needs and rights of all the other people. Therefore, it was better if the governors govern themselves and the people govern themselves and not attempt to impose each other's rules. The answer is to have no rule except the New Testament and not organize it. Do not put anyone out to preach it. Do not even have a preacher in your church. Your religion is to worship directly to the source of truth. Live it in your daily life. Find new fulfillments through dedication. Find more usefulness through labor and find a realization that all the arguments and dissensions and dislikes and hatreds and tyrannies can only be cured by the simple expression of normal human constructiveness. That it's there, but it has been whipped into deceit by pressures. The man who would be honest is the victim of the dishonest man. The laws which are intended to protect the few also afflict the many. All the rules set up by men to solve these problems just do not work. The only way they can be worked out is by the individual himself sit down, sitting down quietly and deciding what is honest. That honesty, without, without honesty, nothing can succeed. With honesty, nothing can actually fail. There will be failures that appear to be real. But where honesty causes failure, it is because the problem was corrupt in the first place. 
Therefore, any corruption must fall. Any virtue must live. The good we do must be encouraged and protected. The evil we do must be eliminated quietly by simply ignoring the results of dishonesty. It, for instance, if a person wants to, to uh, steal from another, he may do so. But if this uh, theft uh, is the result of unreasonable circumstances, if the thief is unable to get a job, then the whole community is as much to blame as the thief. If, however, in selfishness he steals, then he must be given instruction. And the only way you can instruct him in these matters is send him to school. And if it is necessary, send him to school when he's 60 years old. He must be in school until he learns what education is. And education is the determination to do right in the presence of the temptation to do wrong. No one who does wrong is educated. It doesn't make any difference how much schooling he has. It doesn't make any degree amount what degrees he holds. It doesn't indicate how much wealth he has. If he is not honorable, he is ignorant. And this kind of ignorance cannot be taught by institutions that suffer from the same ignorance themselves. A fool cannot educate another fool except by a bad example, which perhaps the other one will notice, or perhaps he won't. Therefore, you must begin to think of what constitutes a country. What is a nation? What is a community? What was the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? It was an area of people resolved to solve problems. As long as that resolution to solve problem continued to dominate, there would be growth. But when that resolution failed and private interest took over, then the colony failed. It was very simple. There was no need for any form of elaborate legislation or the setting up of great systems or anything of that nature. The individual, in the course of his lifetime, as Penn found out, is presented with numerous problems. He must face many disasters, tragedies, sadness. He must face conditions which are unnatural and which he cannot actually change. He must also face the consequences of his own conduct. Until he is taught this, until he becomes aware in childhood to be constantly conscious of his own conduct, if he will keep the principles until he reaches maturity, the principles will keep him for the rest of his life. But without that foundation, there's nothing. The world that Penn ran away from was a curiously troubled one. It had passed through uh, the um, execution of the king and uh, King Charles II and the rise of Cromwell, the misery of the Commonwealth, the restoration of the monarchy, in the midst of it, the great ep epidemic of the fire of London and the return of the Great Plague. It was a difficult and problemed time. It was a time in which the majority of persons not only had nothing to say, but were not able to survive except by various compromises and dishonesties. Dishonesty was necessary because honesty simply did not exist. When Penn moved out from this background, he was resolved that honesty should have a chance that it was not going to be necessary for the individual to go on forever in a state of enforced slavery. It was not necessary for people to be compelled to pick pockets or to rob coaches or to become pirates in order to exist. All of these misfortunes, crime in all, was a testimony of the failure of the system in which it exists. Crime must arise from corruption. Corruption, in turn, must arise from abuses. And abuses, in turn, must arise from ignorance. So that all of these things became part of the life principle which Penn bestowed upon the protectorate over which he had administration. 
He wanted everyone to become religious in his own heart. He wanted each one to search for the mystical experience of the willingness to give themselves completely to the service of God and truth. He pointed out that life was short, that we are only able to make our mistakes for a relatively limited period of time, and then all we can do is hand on the results of these mistakes as a heritage to those who come after us. Actually, therefore, why do what do we gain by the incessant uh, viciousness which we permit to exist? What do we really gain in the life that we live if we corrupt everything that is valuable for a little profit and then die and leave it all behind? What is the reason for living? Are we here simply to die more wealthy than a neighbor? Are we living to have a little fame for a few days and strut the stage and then disappear forever? What is the reason for life? Are we really beings or are we puppets or marionettes? Are we actually creatures that have a purpose? Now, Penn was convinced that we all have a purpose, that our purpose is to make this world a Garden of Eden again as it was before the fall, that it was this possibility that we should hand on to our descendants a world of peace, a world of charities, charity in the sense of love, charitas, not in the sense of almsgiving, a possibility that each generation will leave this world a little better than they found it, and will leave also the inspiration to their young to go on and build and not to tear down. So uh, to work with this, of course, Penn had to fight uh, in England the entrenched selfishness. But now in this country, we are beginning to appreciate what he was trying to do. He was trying to give us, perhaps, the key to the real purpose of our own nation. In a sense, we are a large Pennsylvania. We are much larger in size, much more complicated in our way of life. But as Penn pointed out, most of our complications are artificial. We are complicated because we decline and refuse to be simple. We must make things difficult. And we find today that practically every person is involved in a tangle of circumstances, most of which have little or no real significance and yet they become the dominant reason for living. Penn, Penn, and we will all have to come someday to this general conclusion, was, real, was able to realize that the only way that we could preserve humanity and human civilization was to gradually cooperate to protect it, to make sure that it lived by not abusing it to make sure that we had what we need tomorrow because we were th thoughtful and thrifty today. And the reason also is now, perhaps, in Penn's thinking, what is happiness? What do we have to do to be really happy? Well, one of the first problems of being happy is to keep out of trouble. All kinds of trouble deduct from happiness and make it less and less possible for us to live happy and cheerful lives. Whatever causes unhappiness uh, that is contrary to nature's will and purpose must be corrected. Therefore, to be happy, we must be right. We must do the things we are supposed to do. We must have the attitudes that protect us. It is the same thing with health as with happiness. As long as the individual breaks the rules of mental and emotional health, his physical health will suffer. A natural, healthy life, well-balanced, with dedications to principles, and with sincere fulfillment of all the duties of mutual assistance, these, this is the answer to the future as well as to the past. Since Penn left us, the world has shrunk considerably. The world he knew was very sparsely civilized in comparison to our world. And yet in this world, instead of, our inc of increasing in cooperation, 
we are intensifying competition in the presence of dwindling resources. We are being as selfish as we can, um, almost as though we realize that one of these days we wouldn't have anything more to be selfish about. We are perpetuating the ways of least resistance, sacrificing the future of our own lives, our children, and our world for a few immediate advantages. This was contrary to the Quaker way of life. And the Quaker has a rightness about his way which has been widely recognized and admired. The person who has the right attitude will not sacrifice the values of life for some passing amusement. He will not uh, do the things which will destroy himself simply because he enjoys doing them for a little while. The long-range practical fact is this. There are two kinds of selfishness. Short-range selfishness is get as much as you can for yourself quick. Long-range selfishness is to give as much as you can at all times because in the end you are protecting yourself. The long-range selfishness is the kind that we are overlooking. Now we have today revolutions and all kinds of disturbances. We have tyrannies and atrocities and terrorists everywhere. If we go carefully into this situation, we realize that all of these troubles are hung from a few basic faults that we have allowed to encourage and increase. Some of our most difficult situations arise from political theories. These political theories have uh, victory or have success marked on them. They are demanded, so to say, but the real problem of politics is not who shall own all. The product is, the real purpose of product is to, uh, policy is to say, no one shall be without. Now this is a complete reversal, and yet we are facing it. And we're going to fight it out for as long as we can. We're going to make as much as we can but we're also going to finally value, probably find that the value simply fades out of the things we are holding in our hands. The dollar we are clutching is only going to be worth two cents pretty soon. But uh, and we go on. Hence, that this isn't right. This is a complete abuse of our religion. It is a complete misunderstanding of government. It is completely outside of intelligence and integrity so far as daily labor is concerned. We have got to either change our ways or nature will change them violently because nature must be obeyed. Now when something comes along, we are inclined to think the deity has been very unkind to us. But we, we do not think of how often we have betrayed the divine principle in ourselves. Now Penn, working along, found other little things that made a kind of an interesting viewpoint for everyone concerned. He brought printing to this country very strongly. He laid the foundation for another great Philadelphian who was to follow him, Benjamin Franklin. And he was also uh, a man of such basic integrities that he had a strong influence with other countries and other rulers. Uh, unfortunately, Penn did not live most of his life in this colony. He had to go back to, to England, and in the closing years of his life, he was struck down by paralysis and uh, passed on in the year 1718. But in the meantime, he had left the work he had to do, and many of the greatest historians on record give the unadulterated ad admiration for the things that he attempted and the one principal basis upon which he labored, cutting away everything else. Penn believe that we must obey truth. And Penn and for the Quakers who were with him, it's the uh, Sermon on the Mount was the truth. This is more true than any scientific discovery that can ever be made. This is more true than every, any political structure that can ever be conceived. This is more true than all the medicine that we can develop. Everything that we have 
depends upon the simple truths that are presented in the Sermon on the Mount. To obey these, to bring them into our personal lives, is not always easy. But it's the basis of the only enduring utopian commonwealth. There cannot be selfishness in a redeemed society. And society will not redeem itself while selfishness is a basic statement of its purposes. So Penn finally went back to England where he passed on after a rather difficult life, imprisonment, exile, everything you can think of. But with it all, a realization that we've overlooked probably one of the most important values of life. And that is inner communion. To live constantly in the presence of an inner conviction. Not necessarily a vision, though it might be, merely only a tremendous urge, a great deep recognition of value. Beneath all our insincerities, beneath all our mistakes, there is a deep, wonderful ocean of realities. We are all floating on the surface of something bigger than ourselves, and part of that bigness is in ourselves. There is never a time when man, with the equipment that heaven has bestowed upon him, has not been in a condition or a position to solve his problems. He has chosen, however, a short-sighted approach to existence. He has been perfectly willing to multiply his problems in the hope of adding to his profits. And this procedure goes on with hopefulness. Practically every, um, every indigent person today lives in the hope that he will be a millionaire in due time. Everyone who has not knows that somehow he's going to get. And in this process, he begins to deify those have got, who have gotten, and the entire system goes to pieces. So uh, the simple problem of religion, we're having a very bad dosage of that at the present moment. Most of the problems that he worked on in Pennsylvania are now spread over the entire human family and are getting more and more complicated every day. Many nations believing in God are murdering each other by the thousand. In the name not only of God, but of a God of mercy, of righteousness, and a God of peace. The God who was to bring joy to the world. But his followers have made certain that he did not bring joy even to themselves because of the things he caused. We are informed, of course, that these are basic problems you cannot solve. You can solve them, because there is no one in these different groups who does not hurt, who is not sad, who cannot suffer, who cannot have loss, who cannot see their loved ones destroyed. These things are basic. And while we cover this with a philosophy of loyalties, we are in serious trouble. Loyalty is, and to pen was loyalty to peace, loyalty to truth, and the individual so living that the causes of war were removed from the patterns of social existence. These things can be done, and these things will be done. The great question, of course, is how soon? The answer I think a pen would give to that is it will be done when people want it badly enough to live better. Until then, there is no answer. No government can legislate truth. No system of religion has an option on it. All that counts is a mysterious something within ourselves, which is the very innermost part of ourselves. And that part of ourselves is compatible with other human beings. The, the life locked in each of us dwells in peace with life locked in all others. But we have not allowed this deeper level of unity to correct the surface problems of diversity. We have been willing to allow uh, the lower part of our nature to silence the upper part and found that by living by that code alone, we seem to have an occasional success. But in the last 2,000 years, we have been seeming to have success. And one look at the world today shows what it has led to. Actually, today, we are trying to struggle to find out how we can survive, let alone to succeed. 
We have used everything we knew to turn it against our brother for our own profit, and in so doing, have signed our own death warrants. So Pan was quite right that something had to be done. The utopia that we need would be a universal structure. It wouldn't be limited to Pennsylvania. This utopia would be the whole world gradually waking up to the causes of its own unrest by allowing institutions to fight to the death for principles that none of them understand that levels of society forever competing when all that any of us can ever have in the end is a pile of ashes. So these things must be sometime thought through. There have been other economists, there have been other sociologists who have handled this problem with considerable pressure, but not one of them has had this peculiar experience which Penn calls the holy experiment. This is a, a, an experiment based on a revelation, on a kind of an internal certainty, which caused him to believe and know with certainty that he was destined and foreordained to do this job, that he was the one who in the, in the 17th century was to bring a light to a Europe recovering gradually and painfully from uh, the Protestant Reformation and the medievalism which had locked it in hopeless slavery. Penn was unaware, however, that slavery is not always what it seems to be. An individual can be a slave and at the same time be very rich. He can be rich because it is the slavery to something that guarantees the wealth. But to be rich in freedom in perfect uh, ability to live well, to do the kindly things we want to do every day, to accept the fact that we will be abused and misunderstood at times, but that is not our problem. We are to do right, and the individual who does wrong to us is his problem, not ours. We must continue always in the spirit of brotherhood, the spirit of common <coughs> understanding and gentle uh, remonstrance or affirmation. Actually, as uh, probably many of you realize, the pietists and the uh, various puritanical groups all came here in search of peace. They came here to escape tyrannies. But like in the case of the bubonic plague, many went on ships and out to sea to escape the plague and found that on the ship with them. Many of those who came over here in search of liberty were unable to bestow it upon their own neighbors. They came over here to have their own rights, but everyone else must obey them. And Roger Williams had to leave the colony to save his own life. Every time the, a, a, theolo a theological pressure has been asserted, someone has suffered. And Penn's primary feeling was that the most powerful principle of good in the world is religion, and it has been the most completely profaned. That nothing that is so important should be allowed to be degenerated. And yet the best has become the worst. The very ideas of faith have been exploited into an infinite sectarianism of debating individuals, fighting, struggling, each believing that they alone are right, and persecuting each other in the name of a God of love. This condition, if it continues, takes away from humanity the one true point of strength, the strength that it must have if it is to survive properly. And that strength is the strength of love. Uh, Penn was a great believer in love. Love on any level and of any kind, as long as it was honest, sincere, and honorable. He believed definitely that the only answer to hate is love. And that the answer is that we cannot have love simply by having our enemy agree with us. Love to Penn, Penn was the great gift that the Messiah had given to the world. It was Christ's blessing and Christ's very self upon us. 
It was the one thing that could heal all wounds. And everything that compromises it is in some way detrimental to the good. Love, if it is real, is unselfish. It is certain to be laboring for the common good. Love suffereth long and is kind. And love suffereth always in the cause of growth and happiness. Love as a sincere emotion should be really the cornerstone of civilization. But instead of that, it has been deprived of its values by a vast structure of ulterior motives. Today, ulterior motives have so invaded human affections that the honesty of affection is no longer certain. Paul Penn says it's going to be that way. It's going to be that way until we change it. But we are endowed at birth and before birth. Our ancestry before us was endowed. The world at its beginnings was endowed with the capacity for redemption. Each evil has within itself its own cure. Each mistake has within it its own truth. In one way or another, everything that we have and know can contribute to the infinite and ultimate victory of right over might, of beauty over hatred, of love of over all the dissensions of mankind. It can be done, but it's just too simple. No one wants to get rid of this vast colossus that they themselves have built. But there once in ancient times was a colossal figure of the sun god that stood at the harbor of Rhodes like a great giant. And people came from all over the world to want to venerate and admire this supreme human achievement. In less than 75 years, there was an earthquake and the great image fell. And this glory of the world was finally sold to a second-hand dealer for old metal. Now this is some to, uh, in a way, is sort to of tell a story about ourselves. We have built this great and shining thing, which appears to be very good, but is vulnerable throughout. And we are worshiping and enjoying the prestige of being the greatest nation that ever lived, the greatest period in the history of the world, where all questions are going to be solved except the important ones. They're not going to be solved. So somewhere along the line, we must either dedicate our lives to the perfection of these things which are necessary. Or when we fall, some junk dealer will take away the old metal. We can't escape it in any other way. So Penn just made a simple statement. A statement that is very good. Hard to fulfill, even difficult to imagine. And it is remarkable to say that with all the advantages of knowledge, skill, and research that we have, we haven't also generally discovered it. Namely, that all efforts to advance civilization should be based upon bringing people together in peace. That, they, that understanding, non-competitive, cooperative understanding, with pure intellectual fulfillment of the realization that to work together is to live, to go and work apart from uh, the unity for personal gain is ultimately to perish. We can live only by cooperation. By competition we die. And we have a glorified competition for profit. We must glorify cooperation for survival. If we do not do these things, the future that might possibly be a beautiful and wonderful experience is going to be destroyed by the weakness of people. Now a lot of people recognize this weakness, and young people do. I think there are a great many young people in the world today, generations coming up, who would not be very willing to make great sacrifices for a purpose, to do something that was going to really solve something, to do something that was going to pick us out of this uh, doldrum we have fallen into. I think there are a lot of these young people who would be very interested in the Sermon on the Mount who would like to see it done that way, who would like to have peace for themselves and their children, but do not know what to do and how to begin and where it all has to start. 
Well, probably one of the best working models we have of this problem is Pennsylvania. In its early days, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, was built for the purpose of cooperation. Like all these efforts, it was a little island of peace in a great ocean of uncertainty. Today, the world is in a much more difficult situation. This little island of uncertainty must be expanded to become a world of certainties, continent after continent becoming involved, involved in this new cooperation. The whole theory of separateness, of competitiveness, and of antagonisms must perish from the whole world, or else the world suffers for its own stupidity. We are not being destroyed by an avenging God. We are being hurt every day, being punished, because we refuse to live according to the consciousness and intelligence that has been bestowed upon us by a divine power. We have important bodies to contact the world. We have minds to contact the spheres of thought. We have spirits and souls with which to understand the causes of ourselves. These things must be used as they were intended to be used, the instruments, the workman's tools necessary for the building of the eternal empire of peace. These tools are available. They're in each one of us. They are part of the vision of life, and uh, we have to find ways to release them. And uh, Penn's problem was difficult in his day as ours is now. He solved it the best that he could. We could solve a lot of it also. If we took the plan for the state of Pennsylvania that was developed and uh, incorporated by William Penn and our modern uh, legislators, business people, private citizens, religionists, educators, took this particular program to heart, they might see that they were in the presence of a way by means of which most of the problems could be minimized, could be reduced, and we could begin to get together on things. The problems, the need is known to us all. There are very few people who do not know today what is necessary, but they do not feel that they can do what is necessary to bring these improvements about. They have a greater strength than they know, and Penn knows, knew that. Each one of us can go a long way to correcting the ills of our time if we do not support them, encourage them, and believe that we profit from them. If we are willing to take a long-range look at our own society and quietly and sincerely do what the Quakers did, simply refuse to cooperate with corruption, we would find that corruption itself would lessen very quickly. We would suffer. There would be miseries. There would be all kinds of limitations upon the privileges of the flesh. But we might arise out of this in a resurrection of the principles of human justice. We might become the very people that we were intended to be. And out of a little suffering comes a great enlightenment, a great strength. Weakness is the result of ease. While we just drift along doing nothing important, our strength is not tested and gradually fades away. But strength drawn out to support principles that are necessary, religious principles based upon the actual teachings of Christ and not theology. Uh, philosophical principles based upon the great scholars of the past, like Solon and Plato, scientific discoveries in which we find, as Lord Bacon pointed out, that we are not only searching for the world's truths, but we are also seeking a greater understanding of God and the divine principle at work in things. If we combine the material world to the world of the spirit, if we can find ways to make truth the governor of our conduct, then we will attain Christianity, we will attain a true democracy, and we will protect ourselves from most of the tribulations and delinquencies of the past. He gave a very good working model, a working model of a greater world, a working model of a way of life existing sincerely and basically upon integrity alone and that he, he believed firmly 
that suffering brought out this integrity. The people who came to Pennsylvania were coming to escape persecution, sorrow, misery, offense, and even death. They came to hope for a better way of life, and they found it. Those in need today are trying to escape from the horrors of impending catastrophe. They are looking also for their city of peace, and they are willing to cooperate with a holy experiment if it is made. And this experiment must transcend all profits to individuals and make all human beings safe and sound in their existences into the unknown's future. If we can once get people to stand for principles and to realize that life is based upon great principles of integrity, if we can get them to see this, we can accomplish much. Penn got a few families, a few hundred families, maybe a few thousand together, and they saw the light and they did it. Today, we are a much greater world. We have transportation and communication beyond anything they knew. We have marvelous privileges. We have great solutions to many of the difficulties that they had to face with crude, crude instruments. We can do it. There's no reason why the holy experiment would not work here. But it would work only when we cut through the red tape that has accumulated from intellectualism and get right back to the basic facts of things, to uh, do that which is needed and to do that which will ultimately solve problems. Compromise cannot do it. We've got to face it as it is. Well, thank you very much, folks.